Leapfrog. This spring-loaded villain appears in the What If that has Aunt May gaining Spider-Man's powers instead of Peter Parker. And before you jump down my throat, Leapfrog does appear in other comics first, I know this, actually first showing up in Daredevil number 25, but this iteration of the character is clearly meant to be more slapstick and ridiculous than he normally is, which is saying a lot, considering this must be one of the silliest villains in Marvel. But case in point, his first appearance in this what if issue shows him crashing through a brick wall and just swearing at everybody, screaming expletives as he bounces past a group of civilians and a news reporter. He ends up in a battle with Aunt May's Spider Woman and gets thwarted by nothing other than a stretchy mass of dough that Aunt May uses to lasso him into a tree. He's just clearly such a dumb villain and appears for what I could only imagine was comedic value to the already hysterical what if issue. Number 9, Ghost Grandpa. While technically ghost riders are supposed to be heroes, this one doesn't seem to be too nice in terms of the brief glimpse that we see of him. And it's because of that that I decided to include him as a kind of like a low key villain. Ghost Grandpa makes his appearance in the 1977 What If series in issue number 34, where we ask the question, what if Ghost Rider had possessed someone else, instead of Johnny Blaze of course. The answer allows us to take a look at a few different candidates including Ghost Skater and Ghost Baby, but while both talk about punishing evildoers and getting vengeance, Ghost Grandpa only seems to be interested in getting revenge on his nurse for delaying his glass of warm milk. Number 8 is Wolverine Lord of Vampires. This villain is bizarre because it's the embodiment of a character we've all known forever but who doesn't really exhibit any of his typical traits. In What If Number 24, Wolverine takes on the Lord of Vampires who tries to bite him to turn Wolverine into a vampire himself. And since Wolverine was too badass to simply be turned into a vampire, he decides it's only in his character to kill the guy. And he does, but what happens when you kill the Lord of Vampires is that you take on the title yourself. And this is when Wolverine starts to change into a very strange version of himself. Right away, Wolverine starts turning turning his former friends into vampires with his demeanor totally shifting as he uses like mind control powers on them, which is just pretty strange on its own. Honestly, this is what it is. It's just weird seeing Wolverine without any level of humanity in him anymore. Something about this transformation doesn't seem right and gives me some very conflicting feelings towards the whole thing. Although I gotta say, he does turn out to be a pretty powerful Lord of Vampires. He even takes out Doctor Strange in a harrowing battle, which says a lot for Wolverine on its own. This suggests that the power level this suggests that his power level is pretty heavily increased after getting the title of Lord of Vampires. Doesn't change the pop collar and bat eared hairdo though. This is a list about weird villains, not powerful ones. Although he might end up on both, he still ranks on this one for sure. I mean, just look at it. Number seven, Maggie Nito. Maggie Nito appears in a humor issue of What If. She's the one who terrorizes poor old styrofoam skeleton Wolverine. She's technically supposed to be the female child version of Magneto, who is known in the comics for ripping the adamantium out of Wolverine over the course of a few horrifying panels of comics. Maggie Nito, on the other hand, doesn't need any powers to hurt her version of Wolverine, who is much more cowardly in comparison to his main continuity counterpart. Which, I mean, makes sense, considering he literally has a styrofoam skeleton. I mean, I would be afraid of Maggie Nito too, if I had a styrofoam skeleton. Also just in general, she seems like a mean little girl. Danger. This villain is definitely a weird one. It's basically just the humanoid form of the Danger Room, a highly sophisticated computer interface that the X-Men used to train. But in 2009's Astonishing X-Men number 9, the Danger Room comes to life and takes on a humanoid form that calls itself Danger. Although I know this isn't a what if issue, in 2010's What If Astonishing X-Men number 1, Danger gets a more focused storyline and it's even weirder than you might expect. Basically, Ultron somehow catches wind that Danger has come to life and falls in love with her. They become a couple and go on a murder spree, killing all the X-Men and then eventually Professor X himself. Then they take to the cosmos and continue to kill all the organic life forms in their path, until they finally establish their own intergalactic empire. It's later pondered by the Watcher that if Professor X had only listened to Danger when she declared that she had gained sentience, she wouldn't have been so inclined to take him down. It's sort of a cool message about the dangers of AI, but first and foremost, it's just a weird antagonist in this what if issue. The danger room gets married to Ultron. 
It doesn't get much weirder than that, I don't think. Number five, Thanos. Another one of my favorites has to come from the What If Disney Plus streaming show, where we actually got to see what Thanos would be like if he were on the side of good. So technically here, I guess he's a hero, but of course in the main continuity, we know him better as a villain, both in the comics and the MCU, so yeah. Thanos ends up joining the Ravagers and becoming a close ally of Star-Lord in episode 2 of the show, where we get to explore what the world would be like if T'Challa, instead of Peter Quill, ended up as Star-Lord. And guess what? Turns out the world would potentially be um, a lot better for it. Mine is the imminent doom of the universe as a result of Ego's plot to kind of like take it over, but ignoring that. Other than that, it was doing pretty well for itself, I gotta say. Thanos didn't even snap half the universe out of existence in this reality, and all because T'Challa convinced him not to do so by simply talking him down. Man, where was Black Panther when that was happening before? Why didn't he just come in and be like, hey, look, Thanos, no. Maybe he's got to travel in space before he can have those conversational skills. Maybe that's why. At number four is Cable. So in this two-part What If issue, Cable is the bad guy and he actually kills his parents, Cyclops and Jean Grey, as well as Professor X. Professor X seems to be getting a lot of heat on this list. And even though this is a what if and basically anything goes, it's just a really bizarre call to have part of the X-Men family travel through time to kill his parents and their noble mentor, Charles Xavier. This naturally doesn't go unnoticed and actually starts an all out war between the X-Men and the X-Force. And while these two groups are duking it out, Magneto takes the opportunity to take control of Washington DC, which segues into that second part I mentioned, aptly named, what if Magneto took over the USA? But regardless, this just made me feel weird to see a character we're used to seeing as a hero just take a sudden turn to evil, so much to the point where he kills his own flesh and blood in a brutal massacre. And why? Well. They have some differences in ideology, but why does that matter if they're in the past? Couldn't Cable have just stayed in his own time and believed in stuff over there? Although he's not really known to stay in his own time very often. It's just that he normally does it for good instead of doing it to start a massive war that ends in sentinels dropping nukes on Washington and killing everyone. I don't know, was it worth it Cable? Check out the issue and see if you think. Number three, Elektra. Elektra makes an appearance in the 1977 What If series in issue number 34. This being a humor issue, we get to take a look at what might have happened had Elektra survived her run in with Bullseye. Even though Elektra at this time was depicted as a villain or, you know, at least an extremely edgy anti hero, it seems that this one panel take on the character has her reconsider her life of crime as a result of her near death experience. This is uh, pretty weird, considering I'm pretty sure at this point Elektra would have had already a few near-death experiences in her line of work as an assassin. So, like, unless she knew she was going to die here and then that's not what happened, but I feel like for her this is just an average Tuesday. Elektra even goes so far as to consider settling down and getting married, and I quote, or something. What is or something? Also. Electra getting married just because she didn't die from Bullseye fighting her? Wow, that just seems a little unbelievable. Anything can happen in an alternate reality. Number two is Dazzler. In What If number 33, the question is asked, what if Dazzler had become the Herald of Galactus? These days, Dazzler is known to be a relatively stagnant member of the X-Men and doesn't usually get a lot of mention in the mainstream. Sorry Amanda, Amanda really likes Dazzler. However, in the 80s, it was a totally different story. Right before this issue of What If in 1981, Dazzler is taken on by Galactus as his herald, but only to complete a quick mission to retrieve his original herald. Then she goes back home. But Fast forward one year later to 1982, and in this what if, the situation is revisited again, but in this case, she stays as his herald and actually becomes one of the most powerful villains in all the cosmos. The Herald of Galactus is an individual imbued with part of Galactus's power cosmic, and their job is to fly around the cosmos and look for planets for Galactus to consume. So it's a pretty big deal to be given the title of Herald, both for the one who's selected and for the people of the cosmos, because if you're doing your job right as a Herald, you'd best believe you're ruining and ending the lives of countless others. So. For Dazzler, of all the heroes to be taken in by Galactus and given this responsibility, it just leaves me with a weird feeling in my gut. Like, why would a character that barely wants to be a hero and only really wants to sing, like why, why would they take on the job of Herald of Galactus? 
the answer does lie in this issue, but it's still a bit confusing and maybe a bit out of character for Dazzler, which is why I put it at number two. Number one, Susie Richards. In issue number 30 of the 1989 What If series, Susie, Reed and Sue's second child, becomes the villain. Susie is obviously meant to be a stand-in for Valeria Richards, who we have now, their daughter, who has a weird history where she was kind of both the oldest and then like the youngest child of the fantastic duo. It's, it's confusing, but don't worry about it. In this version of the story, she is most definitely just the younger, but despite being the younger sibling between her and Franklin, she still terrifies her brother who in the main continuity was once known for insanely powerful reality warping abilities. Although I don't think he has those in this reality. But anyways, you know you're scary when you're scaring Franklin. Even a young Franklin. Susie is an evil little girl who it turns out was possessed by a hell spawn that came from the negative zone. In the end, Franklin is forced to fight and defeat her, but unfortunately all too late as the rest of his family has already been killed by her. Even Dr. Doom doesn't stand a chance against the possessed Susie. Poor Franklin, he warned everyone, but they didn't listen. Number 10. What if Mary Jane had been shot instead of Aunt May? This is a really epic and dark story where Peter ends up going on a rampage when Mary Jane is killed by Kingpin's hired sniper assassin instead of Aunt May. Peter manages to save Aunt May, but Mary Jane ends up dead, and as a result, Pete dons his black suit and goes after the Kingpin himself. He is met with resistance when Tony Stark as Iron Man attempts to confront him and talk sense into him. Spider-Man, however, is too far gone and is definitely not in the mood for advice from Tony Stark. This results in an epic fight between the two heroes, while Wilson Fisk's life hangs in the balance of who will win. In the end, Peter ends up getting his revenge, one-punching Fisk to death before being arrested by the authorities. He regrets ever trusting Tony Stark and ever marrying Mary Jane. As Wilson Fisk would say, this issue is so goth. Number 9. What if Spider-Man became the Punisher? This one ends up at least having a happy ending, but starts off being pretty dark and pretty scary. In this story, we imagine what life would have been like for Peter if he had become the Punisher. Instead of beating his villains and them ending up just locked away, for many, their fate is much more final. Even the Green Goblin ends up being killed by Spider-Man Punisher following the confrontation with Gwen at the bridge. Gwen, however, lives, not killed from the great height from which she was dropped. I do love how they keep drilling in that it would be the fall, not the impact, that would kill her, like in the original story, which I always thought was so bizarre. Spider-Man Punisher saves Gwen, but Green Goblin ends up dead, and Harry swears vengeance on the man who killed his father. Although this story has a dark and murderous narrative, it gives us a more happy ending, sort of. Peter chooses love instead of vengeance in the end and gives up being the Punisher, retiring from vigilante life to go be happy with Gwen. As this decision is made, however, Frank Castle loses his family and miraculously survives the shootout in Central Park, in the end becoming the Punisher in this reality as was fated. Although I do think it's really weird in that story that like Gwen living is the thing that like changes that for him. If your like girlfriend's life was threatened, wouldn't that make you more angry? Maybe not. I've never been Spider-Man, so I don't really know. All right, friends, before we move on to this next spot, just a quick reminder to click that thumbs up. It's good for your health. It's good for your heart. It's good for your brain. Number eight, what if Ord resurrected Jean Grey instead of Colossus? In this story, Jean is brought back to life at a time where it is revealed that Cassandra Nova holds influence over Emma Frost. Fearing the return of the Phoenix Force, which would join to Jean Grey once more, Emma decides to take matters into her own hands. Her own diamond hands. It's revealed that the Phoenix Force has been lurking within her cuckoo's minds and she decides to take hold of it, killing them in the process. Tragic. She then plans on defeating Jean. The X-Men band together to face her and S.H.I.E.L.D. and S.W.O.R.D. also conveniently join the fray. It's like, we're here too. In the end, Ord, Beast, Emma, and her cuckoos, and Kitty lay dead, and the Phoenix is contained, but Cassandra remains undetected, still out there waiting for the right moment to strike. Number seven, What If, the spider who went into the cold. This story comes to us from the What If story, Spider-Man vs. Wolverine, and asks the question, what if Spider-Man never came back out from the cold? This story sees Peter Parker actually kill someone while acting as Spider-Man. It was an accident. He thought the person had armor that would protect him from the hit, but it was powered down. Of course, who should be working alongside Spidey when this happens, but of course Wolverine, who shows no remorse for what Spider-Man has done, jokingly suggesting that they cry about it. In the end, this event changes Peter after he and Wolverine save his friend Alex, and this causes him to become a killing machine. He receives further training, and although he still has a sense of morality, no longer has qualms with taking out the bad guys permanently. He leaves MJ and his life behind, setting out to join S.H.I.E.L.D., working 
taking on as a hired Black Ops team. Also, I love a good Spider-Man Wolverine team up because it's just not what you usually get. I love when they team up. Number six, what if Iron Man had been a traitor? I personally think this one is pretty scary if you put yourself in Iron Man's shoes. For me, one of my biggest fears, and I think one of the most human fears out there, is just a lack of control. In Tony Stark's case, he doesn't really have any control over what he does or how he acts in the story, but is forced into being a traitor when a rival country gains control of his heart. If he refuses to do as is demanded of him, he is put through intense and unyielding chest pains and could be killed. This ends up putting him on a path to attempt to kill Reed Richards, all while leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for Reed to follow so that he might be able to figure out that Stark's actions are not his true intentions and that he is being manipulated into harming his compatriots and betraying his country. Number five, what if the man, the monster? This is actually one of the scariest ones for me in my opinion. This story was such an intense story that we didn't even get an introduction from the Watcher, Yuata. Here we have a story where the roles are reversed between Bruce and the Hulk, where Bruce is the monster and the Hulk, or Starman as he's known here, is the sensitive, compassionate one. Here Bruce Banner is a colonel who marries Betty only to mistreat her after being traumatized from years of being mistreated by his own father and witnessing the cruelty his father doled out to his mother. The gamma radiation does split Banner into two beings here, transforming him into another creature with immense power, but this creature is the side of him that actually represents the compassionate side of this trauma. The side who wants to protect, not hurt. Whereas Bruce Banner himself becomes the malicious monster. We hear this story from Betty's perspective who ends up trying to speak out on the way Bruce has treated her, only to have her father not even believe her and send her back to Bruce once she's left. And to later have her confession to Doc Samson manipulated by a Colonel Banner, causing her to end up getting sent to a mental institution. Also I'm not sure what's happening in this last panel of this Comic, if it's just like she doesn't know that they're about to come get her and take her away, or if she's there and she's just like, I'm at, it's fine that I'm here. I'm gonna assume it's the first one because otherwise, that's a really weird way to end that story. Number four, what if Legion had killed Xavier and Magneto? Just imagine how messed up Age of Apocalypse would be, but also you don't have to because the story's gonna do it for you. Thank you, what if? As always, when things get this bad, we have Nate to save the day. Nate Summers believes he can band together his own team of the few heroes left alive after Apocalypse's unopposed rise to take down Apocalypse and even travel back to the past to make things right. Silly Nate Summers. Instead, this only results in Captain America and Wolverine. Wolverine's hair here, by the way, is the real horror show of this story, opposing Nate's plan once it is revealed. Seeing Nate in Apocalypse's armor after Nate has defeated Apocalypse causes them to believe that Nate is trying to kind of take the place of Apocalypse and in essence become a new kind of tyrant, but a tyrant all the same. As Nate uses the Eye of Egamoto and Molecule Man to travel back in time to what he doesn't know is an alternate reality's past, Captain America, armed with Thor's hammer, sends a bolt of lightning after him that kills thousands in that past, setting in motion the apocalypse once more. Ah. Number three, what if danger became a bride of Ultron? I like how the title is a bride, even though in this reality danger becomes like the ultimate bride of Ultron. A bride, as though in this reality, Ultron is like multiple brides. I feel like that never works out for him, to be honest. But either way, this gives Ultron what he has always truly desired that sweet, sweet love connection. I mean, completion, yes completion. That's what he's looking for. After Danger rebels against the X-Men seeking revenge basically for years of being used and trapped as their Danger Room, with no one acknowledging her sentience, Ultron hears her calling out, senses her, and leaves his creation Victor, destroying him in order to find her. The two come together and, as a wedding present, Ultron gives Danger her father, Professor X, helpless against the technology as his telepathic powers don't work on them. Ultron has him crushed and killed killed. The story ends with Danger and Ultron soaring off to bring havoc to the universe, flying through space on their creepy, mishmashed, sentinel child. It's like 
a scary story, but it's also a romance story at the same time. Number two, what if Wolverine was never deprogrammed? This is a pretty scary and gruesome one, I'm not gonna lie. Though, you know, still keeping in line with the PG-13 aspect of comics, a lot of the gore is hidden, but you can still imagine it. And when you imagine what's happening to these people here, it's pretty insane. Here we get to imagine what if Wolverine just kept on being a killing machine, brainwashed into taking out his fellow heroes, including all of those that he loved. As in many of these potential scenarios, it comes down to Wolverine and Kitty Pride. Kitty is unable to fathom how Wolverine could be so far gone that he'd kill her, and yet after witnessing the death of everyone at his hands, including Invisible Woman who is clawed through the bottom of her feet before getting claws right through her face, and Captain America who gets claws right up through the bottom of his jaw through his entire head, she is forced to confront the reality that her mentor and friend Logan is really gone. Like, that's definitely gonna convince you once you see that. You're like, um, okay, there's no hope for you. In the end, she sacrifices her hand, and it's implied her life in killing Wolverine. She faces her hand through his head, turning it solid, and then letting go as Wolverine instinctively slices off her arm, preventing his body from being unable to heal due to the hand lodged in his brain. That'll definitely prevent someone from healing. I don't even wanna think about how you try to do that. How do you function with a hand in your brain? I ask you. Number one, what if Spider-Man had rejected the spider? This is a pretty creepy, crawly, scary one. It begins with Peter Cocoon but refusing to take the spider's path home. Instead, he kills the giant spider that confronts him while in metamorphosis, remaining lost and unable to move forward, only half a being, until Venom escapes Matt Gargan and prison in order to rejoin with Peter Parker, aware that he is stuck in this stasis mode and vulnerable. Venom bonds with the cocoon and after months of battling with Peter inside is eventually reborn as a new being who goes by the name Poison. Half Peter, half Venom symbiote, permanently bonded. Poison confronts Mary Jane at the Avengers Mansion, but after horrifically attacking her, Aunt May, Wolverine, and Luke Cage, and being spurned by her, disappears, resurrecting his first love, Gwen Stacy, and likely planning to turn her into his monstrous bride. Also, there's a weird thing that happens in that story where that poison basically pierces Luke Cage's skin, and then he's like, haha, even I can pierce your stone skin because I'm sharp enough, and I was like, Wait, what just happened? Doesn't really make a lot of sense. But other than that, it's all pretty good, I think. Number 10, Dr. Moreau. The interesting thing too about Dr. Moreau is that some spelling for this character is like Dr. Moreau, but if you actually look at the comic itself, it's Moreau with a U, so I believe it's Moreau with a U, but if you say Moro and I say Moro, that's also fine. <laughs> I'm not gonna come for you. Dr. Moreau appears in the What If issue number 11 from the 1997 series. Here we answer the question, what if the Marvel bullpen had been transformed into the Fantastic Four? Being from a different time period, there are definitely some extremely uh, sexist tones in this issue. A lot of it aimed, sadly, at fabulous Flo Steinberg, who stands in for Invisible Woman. But another ridiculous aspect of this issue, aside from that more serious one, are some of the villains that we see the bullpen version of the FF face off against. Like their first villain, Dr. Murrow. Dr. Murrow's island was the one that they planned on visiting before they were delivered some fan mail. Upon opening it up, they found a mysterious radio-like device which transformed them into the Fantastic Four, granting them powers after they were exposed to cosmic rays that the device emitted. Turns out that this was all part of a Skrull plot, which we find out later in the issue, and that Dr. Murrow was also a victim of a similar device. Oh no. But even with that, why did he attack them when they got to his island? Why is he a villain in all this? Why is he one of the first villains we run into? Did the transformation like make him, I don't know, just really mad or something? Or violent? The reality is they probably just wanted to start the issue off with a good fight and a bit of mystery, but still, Murrow ends up being a pretty bizarre villain because of this because there's things that just aren't explained here. Oh well, I, I'm willing to come along for this strange ride in any what if. Number nine, disappointed Loki. In the what if story, what if the Hulk had the brain of Bruce Banner, we get to see what would happen if the Hulk had kept Banner's wits and then ran into Loki's illusion, you know, with the train tracks and such. Turns out this version of the Hulk was too smart to fall for Loki's trap. Seeing the TNT on the train tracks, but believing it to be an illusion, meant that he would never be put onto a collision course with the Avengers and therefore 
or would never join that team. Instead, Loki ends up disappointed, and Banner goes on to fight against Galactus, joining with Professor X and Reed Richards to create the new and extremely powerful uni being of X Man. Poor Loki, though, he's like, but I set this trap in. All right, <laughs> I guess not all traps are winners. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to show some support for us on other platforms, head on over to Facebook, give us a like, give us a follow, it does help us out, and we're gonna have lots of exciting new content coming for you over there. <gasps> Exciting. Number eight, Fake Captain America. Both weird and great in a lot of ways. Fake Captain America was William Burnside. Now, while William Burnside does exist in the 616 universe, where he was a well meaning Captain America imposter driven mad by improper use of the super soldier serum, in the what if reality of Earth 84444, he ended up becoming obsessed with communists, paranoid that they could be lurking around every corner, which is kind of what happened in the main continuity, but. In this one, he's less like, oh no, it's just the super soldier serum, and more like he made some conscious choices here. Modeling America into less of a democracy under the name of Captain America, Burnside would be beaten back by the real Captain America, who in this story doesn't resurface until 1984, which means that Burnside has a lot of time to basically do harm to the American image and the influence of the nation's people. This warning story and the speech the real Cap gives at the end are both still pretty relevant today, which is why this is like a great issue, but also why it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's kind of weird how there's a lot of stuff in this that I feel like is still relevant, even though it's from 1984. Do we ever do new things or does history just cycle in like some vicious loop? Probably that. Number seven, Colonel Bruce Banner. What if Bruce Banner was actually the monster and Hulk was just purely the good guy? Well, that is the question we dive into in issue 91 of the 1989 series. Here, Bruce Banner mistreats his wife, Betty Ross, who eventually becomes, of course, Betty Banner. Bruce is cruel and unkind, but after he is involved, in a gamma radiation explosion, another half of him emerges, a glowing green light-like figure who is gentle and kind and we know as Starman basically this world's Hulk, and he was actually terrified of Bruce himself. Not only is this villain pretty interesting, unique, and strange, but the story is also like epically sad. Despite Betty reaching out for help to both her father and others around her, it seems that no one actually really believes Betty when it comes to the fact that like Bruce mistreats her? In the end, she is confined to a mental institution, as she is believed to have gone insane. But at least there, she appears to be safe from Bruce and his cruelty, so it's like a sad, but I guess sort of happy ending. It's bittersweet is what it is. Ugh. Number six, Mr. Fantastic. So, Mr. Fantastic in this story is still Reed Richards, but He's also Dr. Doom. Let me explain. In issue number six of the 1997 What If series, we get to explore an alternate world where the Fantastic Four were granted different powers. These powers seem to have been inspired more by their personality traits. As such, Reed Richards becomes a big brain. Literally, he's just a brain. Instead of him staying as a big disembodied brain though, with mental or psionic capacities, if you will, he ends up being convinced by Dr. Doom to go with him so that Doom might help him by using his knowledge of robotics to build him a humanoid body. You know that when Doom is like, please, l let me help you, Reed Richards, that's not what's about to happen. In reality, Doom's plan is to use Reed's powerful brain form to power his time travel machine. The Fantastic Four come to save Reed and a battle ensues, eventually resulting in a massive explosion when Doom attempts to activate his machine. Just as the explosion goes off though, Reed manages to use his mental brain powers to move his mind into Doom's body. As a result, Doom, which I assume moves into Reed's brain form, ends up dead, and Reed lives on, but within the scarred body of Dr. Doom. So now it just looks like Doom is leading the FF. Pretty cool, but also pretty weird. Number five, Space Admiral Von Strucker. In the What If story from issue number 14 of the 1977 series, we answer the question, what if Sergeant Fury had fought World War II in outer space? Turns out that events would be as expected, pretty weird. The whole premise is that on this alternate Earth, humans got to space a lot sooner and ended up being pulled into a conflict where they fought against the Baytans. Strucker himself was an admiral. Strucker would end up on the side of humanity, but would ultimately betray humankind and Earth to ally himself with the Baytans. He saw an opportunity for Germany, who he was more loyal to than, you know, just Earth in general. Even though, you know, Germany's part of Earth, so I feel like maybe an interesting choice 
on his part. Basically, he believed that if the Beitans took over as their allies, Germany would be in a better place than they were now. So he decided to betray his fellow space soldiers, which actually I guess kind of does make sense considering everything that happened after World War One. Space wars are always fun and weird though, and this story and its antagonists are, of course, no exception. Number four, Hypnofish. The Hypnofish that appears in What If issue number one from the 1977 series is actually a character that has appeared in the main continuity. A character? A type of fish? <laughs> Whether there is only a single Hypnofish or more than one, this is a character who has only made a few appearances in even the main continuity since their first 616 appearance in 1963 in Fantastic Four issue number 14. But they also appear as Namor the Submariner's villainous ally in the first What If issue where we answer the question, what if Spider-Man had joined the Fantastic Four? The end result is that Namor successfully uses his hypnofish friend to kidnap Sue Storm, but instead of being rescued as she was in issue number 14 of FF, she ends up staying with Namor and uh, ultimately becoming his queen. All because Spider-Man is on the team, which leaves her kind of feeling like isolated from them. In the end, his hypnofish and mentofish plot is successful, and Sue chooses to remain with Namor. Also, yes, there are also mento fish. That's a thing too. An even more rare thing than hypno fish, I believe. Number three, Loki, Prince of Jotunheim. Another one of my favorite episodes from Marvel's and Disney Plus's What If series for just how lighthearted and adorable it was, was one that asked the question, what if Thor were an only child? The answer was that Thor would basically be kind of a well-loved Brad who was obsessed with partying as opposed to heroics. Not only did we get party Thor in this episode though, we also got friendly frost giant Loki, who is also known of course as the Prince of Jotunheim. Instead of Loki being adopted by Odin and growing up to be the villain we normally know him as, the sort of jealous and vengeful brother of Thor, he becomes Thor's best friend and ally who also seems to enjoy a good party. And I gotta say, I kinda love it. <laughs> super weird and super great. Number two, Galactus. Galactus is a pretty complex character. Sometimes he's a villain, at times he's been a hero, currently I'm pretty sure in the main continuity he's dead and his core is maybe being used as part of Thor's throne room. But either way, when it comes down to it, despite being a cosmic inevitability, Galactus often threatens entire worlds with his hunger, which, you know, it feels pretty villainous. And yet even he can end up with a happy ending where he gets to enjoy the simple life. All it takes is for Thanos to use the Infinity Gauntlet to wipe his mind and send him to Earth to live as a human. Hey, it's so easy. In this story, this attempt to neutralize Galactus results in him being recognized, despite his amnesia, as Elvis. This is because Galen in his human form happens to sound and look just like Elvis, coincidentally. When Adam Warlock finds him after defeating Thanos and offers to return Galactus to his prior form and power, he actually refuses and decides to live out his days on Earth with his new partner Gertrude and her son, basically filling in as the planet's, uh, I guess, Elvis replacement following the mysterious death of the real Elvis. Which, I mean, fair enough. I mean, if I came to Earth and then people thought I was Elvis, I'd probably be like, you know what? I think I'm good. I'll just chill here. This is a pretty good life. Number one, Juggernaut. In this bizarre what if issue, we ask the question, what if Professor X of the X-Men had become the Juggernaut? Which is a strange question and is also a great question. Obviously, instead of his brother, Kane Marco obviously, who is normally the juggernaut. This story takes place in the pages of issue 13 of the 1989 What If series. Here we see that Professor X is trapped under the rubble of the caved-in tomb where Sidorak's gem awaited an avatar. So Charles becomes the avatar of Sidorak and not only gains great physical power, but has his psychic mutant power basically increased as well. Because he was not around to form the X-Men, the Fantastic Four fight against Magneto in their place, which causes anti-mutant hysteria as a result. In response, when Juggernaut surfaces, he creates his own team of mutants to enforce anti-human laws in response, Woo! becoming a powerful villain as opposed to friend and ally of humankind. Would have gone a lot differently.